This is chapter three, the third part of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, as translated by Michael Beloved. Chapter three is called Glory Displayed. The yogi must be so familiar with the realm of mind and emotions that he should begin to recognize where thoughts, ideas, images, and memories arise. Their particular location in the mind, environment, and emotional atmosphere should be known. Then he may practice the sixth stage of yoga, which is linking of the attention to a concentration force or person through a restricted location in the mental emotional space. But in the seventh stage of yoga, the next stage, that of dhyana, the yogi experiences that there is a continuous thread-like flow of his instinctive interest to the selected location in the mind or emotion. This is the effortless linkage of the attention to a higher concentration force or person. When, however, that sense of effortless linkage of the attention joins continually to a particular location in the mind and emotions or outside into a higher dimension, it is the highest stage of yoga, that of samadhi. It may be a link to a greater yogi or to a divinity. This is experienced as illumination of the higher concentration force or person while the yogi feels as if devoid of his conditioned self. The three higher stages of yoga when practiced in sequence are considered as the complete restraint. Then the sixth stage directly progresses into the seventh and the seventh into the eighth and final stage. By regular practice of the sequential three higher stages, one gains mastery over the mental and emotional urges and then the illuminating insight becomes available for usage. But this development occurs in stages. This higher yoga concerns voluntary control over the psychological organs in the mind and the creative urges in the emotions. But even that initial mastership of the three higher stages of yoga is external in reference to meditation, which is not motivated by the mental and emotional energy. Therefore, you should strive to reach the advanced stages. It may be asked, what is the description of the mind and emotions when the creative urges cease? The answer is this. The mind, and, and the mind energy and emotional feelings periodically assume of their own accord a stillness wherein there is no activity. This happens just after an idea or image subsides and just before another one begins. The interim period may be long or momentary. When this happens impulsively, a yogi has no control over it, but he should still observe it and focus sharply on the blank interval. He should carefully note that the location where the idea or image subsides. He should attach his attention to that place in the mind or emotion environment. When practicing, however, he should, with attention, suppress any emerging idea or image and hold his mind or emotion in that blank state so that no other idea or image expresses itself. When one learns how to use the attention to suppress any emerging idea or image and to hold the mind and emotions in that blank state, that mastership causes a flow of spiritual peace. Impressions from that restraining activity do enter the memory. Those records of it aid and support the yogi, giving him more and more power over the impulsive creative urges. When a yogi first gets a foothold on this mastership, he notices a decrease of the various impulsive objectives of the mind and emotions, and an increase in the blank duration which occurs between the emergence and the disillusion of ideas. 
The blankness of the mind and emotions is the desired objective for that initial samadhi practice, even though perception will develop later in it. By this practice, one gets personal experience of the changes, the quality, shape, changing conditions of the various states of matter and the sensual energy. Thus, the mental and emotional provinces are clarified and are no longer a muddlement or vague environment, nor does one confuse one's self with it. When the emerging, manifesting, collapsing, or not yet manifested ideas, images, or emotions push back into the mental or emotional energy, and when that energy has a blankness or quiescence, that is the most basic condition. But when there is expression of ideas, images, or emotional feelings, these are usually different because of the sequential changes in the emotional energy which produces them. When the yogi repeatedly pushes back the images or emotions into the mental and emotional energy, he gains access to the deeper layers of the memory, even to those from previous lives, and he gains perception of those future possibilities which would be based on past impressions. The yogi removes himself from biases which relate to sound, and when he can steady his attention on that alone, getting beyond words, sounds, and their formation, he makes contact with the object being described by any creature. Thus, their different languages do not confuse his perception. The yogi gains knowledge of his previous lives by developing direct, intuitive perception of the subtle impressions stored in his own or another's memory. Though he can know the mental or emotional content of a person, he should not seek to use that skill. Unless he is advised to do so by a senior yogi, he should not exercise that skill. The tendency of the memory and imagination is to check, recheck, create, and recreate opinions and conclusions. An advanced yogi eliminates this tendency because it hampers higher yoga. Thus he does not allow his mind to project one idea after another in an endless sequence which entertains or keeps one occupied without any increased control over the emotions. When the receptive energy of the subtle body is curbed, the yogi develops a resistance to social contact. This causes him to have some invisibility. This imperceptibility may be applied to the other sensual perceptions. By applying his attention to current or destined cultural activities, when no other ideas, images, or memories occur in the mind, the yogi gains insight into the hereafter. Or he may apply his attention to supernatural occurrences which cause his perception of worlds in other dimensions. By applying his attention to friendliness within his nature and in the subtle cosmic environment, he develops universal benevolence. By applying his attention to strength personally or generally, he acquires the power of an elephant. This type of application is effective in other aspects. When after much practice, a yogi develops the supernatural insight, he would, of course, apply it to the force which produces cultural activities. Thus, he gets information about what is subtle, concealed, and what is remote from him. He may apply his supernatural insight to the sun god or the sun planet. Thus, knowledge about the solar system is gained. From an application to the moon or moon god, he gets knowledge about the system of stars. By application to the pole star, he can know of the course of the planets and stars. 
by supernaturally focusing on the navel energy gyrating center, the yogi gets knowledge about the subtle layout of his subtle body. By focusing on the gullet, he causes the suppression of appetite. By focusing on the Kurma Nanda Nandi nerve, which runs from below the gullet down the inner center of the subtle body, he acquires steadiness of his psyche. By focusing on the shining light in the subtle head, he gets views of the perfected beings. By focusing on the shining organ of divination in the head of the subtle form, he gets the ability to know all reality. By focusing on the causal body in the vicinity of, his, of the chest, he gets thorough insight into the cause of the mental and emotional energies. Experience in the material world results from the inability to distinguish between the individual spirit and the intel intelligence energy of material nature, even though they are in fact very distinct. By complete restraint of the mental and emotional energies while focusing on self-interest distinct from the other concerns, a yogi gets knowledge of the individual spirit. From that focus is produced supernatural smelling, tasting, seeing, touching, and hearing through the shining organ of divination. But those divination skills may prove to be obstacles in advanced yoga practice. But to worldly people, they are considered as spectacular powers. The entrance into another's body is possible by slackening the cause of bondage to cultural activities and by knowing the channels which the mental and emotional energies use to entertain and dominate the self. By mastery over the air, which rises from the throat into the head, in the subtle body, a yogi can cause his gross form to rise over or not have contact with water, mud, or sharp objects. By conquest of the digestive force in the gross body, a yogi's subtle form blazes or shines with a fiery glow. By special focusing on the hearing sense and space, a yogin develops supernatural and divine hearing. By linking the mind to the relationship between the body and the sky and linking the attention to being as light as cotton fluff, A yogi acquires the ability to objectively pass his subtle form through the atmosphere. By restraining his response to the mental and emotional energy, which is universal, a yogi achieves the great bodiless state. From that, the great mental darkness which veils subtle light, light is dissipated. By restraining his mind and emotions while linking the attention to gross forms, real nature, subtle distribution, and super subtle states of matter, a yogi gets conquest over them. From the assumption of minuteness and other related mystic skills come the perfection of the subtle body and the non-obstruction of its functions. Beautiful form, charm, mystic force, diamond-like definition, come from the perfection of the subtle body. This is attained by mastership of kundalini yoga. From supernatural linkage to sensual grasping, to the form of the sensual energy, to its identifying powers, to its connection instinct and to its actual worth, a yogi acquires conquest over his relation with the sensual energy. Subsequently, he progresses into conquest over the influence of subtle matter and over the parting away or dispersion of the mental and emotional forces having the required swiftness of mind. Only when there is distinct discrimination between true perception of material nature and the spiritual personality does the yogi attain complete disaffection from the same nature 
and all applicative intuition to whatever he encounters. By a lack of interest, even to that skill, when the cause of that defect is eliminated, the absolute isolation of the self from the lower psyche is achieved. On being invited by a person from the gross or subtle mundane place, one would attain, if the body died, a yogi should be non-responsive. On being invited by a person from the gross or subtle mundane place one would attain if the yogi died, a yogi should be non-responsive, not desiring their association and not being fascinated. Otherwise, that would cause unwanted features of existence to arise again. And he would take again, he would again take birth in this world or appear in a dimension near to this one from which he would be transferred here again. Four more verses. By supernatural linkage of his attention to the moment in time and to the sequence of moments, the yogi has detailed supernatural information. Subsequently, the yogi clearly distinguishes between two similar realities which otherwise could not be sorted due to lack of definition in terms of their general category, individual characteristic, and location. Thus, the yogin need no longer take recourse to the normal methods of perception and analysis. For him, the distinction caused by subtle discrimination is the crossing over or transcending of all subtle and gross mundane objects in all ways they are presented. When by mastership of Kriya Yoga, there is equal purity between the intelligence energy of material nature and the spirit, then there is total separation from the error-prone, spiritually misleading, mundane psychology. That was chapter three, part three of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, Glory Displayed. This translation is available on Amazon by Michael Beloved. Thanks for listening. One more chapter. Chapter four is next.